Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and Jordi is indeed correct. The, another very broad title for this could have been How I Learned to Love the Milky Way While Waiting for JWST for a Decade. But, that's, um, but let's take that title seriously, namely Reading Physics and the Formation of the Milky Way from Stellar Spectra. And I will actually talk about how to get interpretable quantitative physical attributes of stars from their spectra, millions of them eventually, and certainly for a person like me who comes from the galaxy world that bears an explanation why I spend so much time on this because everybody knows that stellar spectroscopy is basically a solved problem and has been for the last 50 years or 30 years. My take on this really was one that I just wanted to understand galaxy formation taken the Milky Way as a poster child because the Milky Way is in some sense a pleasantly average stereotypical galaxy in the universe but the one we can actually see star by star. And it turns out that this talk kind of represents a very personal journey for me launching into this five, seven, eight years ago with great naivete. Fine, I just get all these parameters from the stars. I w was then in some state of horror, post naive horror of how hard it was actually to believe things that came out of the spectral pipelines and then this is the beautiful rabbit hole that I went into but no worry I will actually in this talk take you for half an hour or so through stellar spectroscopy but then return to why in my view that was worthwhile to actually learn about the Milky Way. So what I'll do is I'll just for motivation do my galaxy formation in two and a half slides because then I'll tell you what I'd like to learn from the spectra. So when asked what is the point of studying galaxy formation I guess there are always the two answers. If you're a true cosmologist or real fundamental physicist then you have to merely understand the baryonic component well enough that galaxies and all this stuff can help you make precise measurements. But of course you can also acknowledge that galaxies themselves the formation is a very exciting process and from my perspective the most remarkable thing about this is the question of why does this shown here in a movie complex scalar formation lead to such regularity both in the population of um, galaxies. I give you the total stellar mass of a galaxy. There are many other things you can guess about this galaxy. Its shape, its mean metallicity, mean stellar age, etc. But also within a galaxy there is an immense amount of regularity. And so um, what has been running in the background here is just one galaxy from the illustrious TNG simulations that my colleague Annalisa Pilatic has been running with Volker Sprengel, Mark Vogelsberg colleagues. What's been shown here is of course in the middle basically the gas density in the left panel little hard to see. Um, let me 
do I go back to this? No, I will not. Re yeah, let me go for a second back to this. Um, if it comes back, right? So, the point I wanted to make here is you see large scale structure bottom left, stars in the middle inset, then gas detailed in the far inset. At first, down to redshift 2, the formation of Milky Way like galaxy is quite messy, but then a fairly nice disk actually um, forms. You see the process of gradual enrichment here characterized in color coding by the metallicity. And actually, the Milky Way is one of those galaxies we have lived a sheltered life. So, actually, modulo um, the the flyby of the Magellanic Clouds actually not much has happened to us and I'll actually come back to whether if no trauma, no merger has happened, does that mean nothing interesting happens within the galaxy. And so, I had mentioned that, will this actually jump forward? Okay. That there are two ways of looking at galaxies both as incredibly messy, which you can call rich, complex, what have you. Um, and let me just show you two examples, right? This is in, with Guy you can now make nice maps of the young stars in the solar neighborhood. This is from Eleanor Azari and you see, you know, stars are born in patches and blobs. If you look at their orbit structure here, just show you one example. The vertical axis is the radial action, the in and out motion. Think of the eccentricity as a function of phase. And I always say the famous book, Galactic Dynamics, been in Germain. Most, I think 600 of the 800 pages are about the phase mixed part of galaxies, and they clearly aren't. And of course, um, the phase based spiral named after Teresa is a local example that you could also show here, right? So, if you look close enough, all kinds of stuff is happening. Yet, if you take a step back and try to do overall properties, shown on the left side here, a Ah, you my, pr my projector. A galaxy like this, if you take its average stellar mass profile, it actually comes out to be exponential. And most disks have approximately exponential stellar profiles. Um, and actually, at the end of this talk, I will offer you an explanation of why disks are exponential just as one example how we can use the information that I walk you through to learn or to explain the population of galaxies. So, hold the thought, we'll come back to why disks are exponential in a bit. So, really let me now come to the how to get physics out of stellar spectra, but it's important to keep in mind what I said before that really all I wanted to do is to construct and interpret the distribution of orbits now available with Gaia, the age of stars, their composition um, uh, in the galaxy, which you can write down, right? The ultimate thing you can get is, what is the joint distribution of position velocity or orbit age and abundances reflecting the self enrichment of the Milky Way and also abundances serve as the other purpose, namely they are lifelong tags. They are the ID number tattooed onto the stars that they cannot get rid of no matter what happens. And um, stellar spectroscopy, like so many other fields, also is indeed undergoing a golden age or at least an age where the amount of information follows Moore's law. The number of stars with good spectra has been e folding about once every one and a half years, and that is likely to continue to go on. Uh, my personal favorite, if you look on the left, it's a little hard to see in this low contrast. This is, you know, about 10 years ago, this is the little red patch here, is where we had information, uh, good spectra in the Milky Way. Then I've been a lifelong Sloan uh, survey member. In the left, you now see Apogee. And now we will launch at the end of this year 
um, focusing on the galactic disk on the SDSS-5 survey, which you cannot see, but basically using infrared will actually go throughout the entire disk and also to the far side. Okay, so if one looks at stellar spectra, um, the first thing you see is this is just a sliced spectrum. They are incredibly information rich, your photosphere, all kinds of absorption lines. And um, so all you have to do is build a model for it and learn what um, the properties of the star are so that it produces a spectrum like this. And so the way this is done is remember you only see the ultra thin photosphere of the star. So you do radiative transfer wavelength dependent. That's the first choice you have to make. There's an enormously convenient approximation local thermodynamic equilibrium. It's kind of a good approximation, but as spectrum that's another way of looking at the situation as spectra get better. The shortcomings of your models become both more apparent and are simply the limiting factor of the whole affair. So do radiative transfer then you need to have atomic data for all the line transitions. This is just a little patch of the, of the iron atom. Those are almost inevitably imperfect. Then it is actually true that most um, most stellar spectra are being modeled as flat and dead. That is 1D, often planar and certainly static. And we know from the sun, of course, that the surfaces of stars bubble and photons like to escape where it's easiest from them. So velocity shifts in eddies actually change the radiative transport and are important. And then what one would like to do is you, I, you just make a model, you specify stellar parameters. What is the mass? What is the radius? What is the bolometric luminosity which gets converted into log surface gravity and effective temperature, etc. And then you specify the periodic table which you have in twofold uh, copy here in the room or at least the relevant parts of it. And then you predict a deterministic spectrum because stars are really in um, hydrostatic equilibrium to quite a good approximation. So at least in the time average you can do that. And then you fit and you learn, right? That's, that's how it's supposed to go. And the beauty and the bane of this is the following. Let me start with the beauty. So this is from Apogee. The, um, the black is a spectrum. The red is a model calculated the way I described. And damn it, that is a beautiful fit to a very complex spectrum. So you choose a certain set of abundances, stellar parameters, that's how it comes out. What can go possibly go wrong? You know, if you look close enough, you know, in some places there are small deviations. So that looks good that you can predict the spectrum that, you know, unless you've stared for hours, looks like the spectrum that you observe. There have been two issues. The first one has been that small systematic mismatches exist and you see them. And secondly, people have said I cannot calculate a grid of 50 dimensional models to fit all of these abundances simultaneously. And the reason why you'd like to fit them simultaneously is because all features are blended. And so if things are in the data covariant you have to fit them at the same time. And so that's why it turned out that the inverse mapping half spectrum want the numbers out is actually a much harder and much less stable problem. And indeed the, um, the resulting things are um, temperatures, surface gravities, which is really bolometric luminosity and mass radius of the star are inconsistent. I show this with just two little uh, plots. The middle plot on the right hand side shows the magnesium abundance, one of the easier ones for is the same set of stars which I have suitably anonymized the survey one and survey two. Their formal error bars are much smaller but even for the best spectra you just get out different answers. And if you take this part of the spectrum 
or that part of the spectrum, you may end up getting different answers even though there is no doubt that the fraction of atoms in the photosphere that are magnesium is the same irrespective of which wavelength you look at them. And the bottom part is log hard to read the effective temperature and log g the surface gravity and the dots are where in this particular survey the stars lie and the lines are isochrones basically the set of possible hydrostatic solutions that exist. So basically if you just look at the photosphere you infer radius mass luminosity combinations that have no actual known hydrostatic solution for stellar structure. Um, so, the traditional remedy has been let me take a line that is isolated, let me take a line that is relatively weak where abundance scales linearly with line strength and just fit that one line. Now, that is the theorist's view because taking spectra at infinitely high resolution and infinite signal to noise costs a lot of money. Let us not forget each night at the VLT is 100,000 euros or 80,000. So, the question is really can one A get rid of those systematics and B um, get all those abundances out in an easier way that respects the information content of the spectra. And so, um, what I will now walk you through is a work that I have done with Melissa Ness and uh, Yansen Ting and David Hogg in the last years that can overcome this and this has to do with uh, data driven um, spectrum modeling and really revolves around the fact that can we industrialize stellar spectroscopy. Let me presume for the sun and 50 other stars we have gotten it right and then can we learn from this about the millions of other stars whose ages abundances we want to learn to restore the Milky Way's um, formation history. And also there is a practical thing namely what does one need to do to fit all stellar labels simultaneously. I will only touch this very briefly, um, but the short answer is like in all parts of physics if you can reduce things to linear algebra all computational problems have gone away. But I said getting physics from spectra and now I am talking data driven next thing I will not say neural net and other things because um, rotation, but the one point I do need to make as a Heidelberg spectroscopist is that stellar spectroscopy actually did start out data driven namely the bottom Kirchhoff and Bunsen's experiment at the bottom the Fraunhofer lines, no way of calculating them and mapping them to any element except in data space you make a comparison with a spectrum where you know the answer for completely different reasons and there you have it. Right? That, that is actually in a modern sense very much a clean data driven experiment. Um, now, let me walk you through this for a second. Our goal would be again to, estab uh, to extract from spectra what I call labels you know temperatures, uh, surface gravities and abundances and what I show you here works and only has started working in the age where you have large sets of spectra of stars taken with the same experimental setup. And this starts with you have to swallow the following assumptions but I think they are actually very sound assumptions. The first one is the spectra of stars are essentially deterministic. That is stars that have the same mass, radius, age, composition etc yield the same spectra. That is not true for some stars you know M dwarfs have blotches and this kind of stuff, but broadly it is true. The second thing is spectra change smoothly as you crank up the temperature or the log g. And the last one the assumption is we have those labels for a subset of points and now we want to industrialize this. Um, and note whether I have gotten this the correct labels from an esteemed colleague of mine or God directly does not matter let us just presume we have those labels. And 
This is an approach we have uh, dubbed the cannon, that is any jump cannon. And so let's just presume we know a subset of spectra for which we know those labels. And let me just for mathematical display purposes take the very simplistic case that the flux of star n is just a linear function of these labels at each pixel with some scatter. Then first semester physics you have 50 such examples or a thousand such examples. You optimize um, in a chi-squared sense the coefficients to predict the spectrum. Good. Now you pull out a spectrum of a star for which you don't know the answer but taken with the same setup. But of course that star doesn't know that I don't know the answer. So the same labels actually apply and so I can use the coefficients I've determined here and solve for the unknown labels. And again uh, it you know in practice I should say I've just shown this here as a linear model because then you can see it you can generalize this uh, however you want and that is important to do it optimal. And so what can we do with it? I'm just going to show you um, uh, one or two examples before getting to the what I think is the most exciting part about this getting ages. Namely, I've shown you here we can um, spectra of one star at the top a high resolution spectrum that real spectroscopists trust how to get the answer. At the bottom a spectrum at very ro low res spectral resolution 1800 well, for long spectroscopists have said you cannot get really very good information out of this, but of the same star. And the one is at the bottom from the Lamost survey, which has 5 million stars, and the other one from Apogee, a high resolution survey, which has had at the time about 100,000 stars. Good. They're a couple 10,000 in common. And so, what this tells me is I as shown here, I take the right answer, the temperatures, etc., from apogee. I take this to be ground truth, and then I say at the bottom, I have an example of what a spectrum looks like if those are the parameters. And then I build this model as just shown, and then you can cross validate, and it's just shown here on the left. You can actually get from, so this is what we take to be ground truth, high resolution. And this is from low resolution spectra. You get temperatures to 50 Kelvin, which those of you who do spectroscopy is actually quite astounding precision. Log G to point the surface gravity to point 0.1 dex and abundance is to about 500. Note that you know we haven't done physics here. We just have said we can we know what apogee would have gotten if it had taken that spectrum. So. Um, we do not create ground truth, but we can propagate it amazingly effectively. So by construction, you see there's no offset. We eliminated systematics between surveys. It turns out if you use the whole spectrum, you only need 20 percent of the photons to get the same precision. And you can reanalyze surveys on laptop and you get consistency across surveys. I mean, I think in astronomy often, you know, getting technicalities right is l less appreciated than in physics, but I, I, inconsistencies amongst surveys have been a bane of the field. Um, so let me now actually jump over this part and um, talk about how we can use these concepts to get ages of stars and ages in an interesting and different way. So reminder why ages if we re want to reconstruct the formation in chemical element enrichment history of a star anything that has to do with evolutional history age is the elementary number to get and also as a reminder if the definition of an equilibrium in which stars are basically means you have no explicit time dependence. So Really, the first thing to keep in mind, ages of stars are not observables. What one can say, fine, can we use stellar evolution models to take those? And I've indicated here, you know, again, this is 
effective temperature luminosity isochrones, right? That's the stellar evolution expectation if you are a star say of 3.2 giga years of solar metallicity say then you lie on one of these isochrones which are just a sequence of mass. And there are two things to see and that's of course standard astronomy. There are parts of this diagram, this HR diagram where stars lie in the same spot irrespective of age or at least nearly so and there are parts where they are widely separated. For example, the turn off or subgiant branch this part here. So that's the right way. We have Gaia, hallelujah, you have distances, you get luminosities. For stars here, you read it off. There are two drawbacks. Most stars don't live there because that's actually a region you cross very quickly in your, your evolution. And secondly, note that 10 giga year old stars in this phase are 10 times fainter than 1 giga year old stars. So in any flux limited survey, your survey volume is a thousand times smaller for the old stars than the young stars. That's a problem. Giants, this later phase here, um, I have the mouse, right, have the great advantage all, almost basically everybody becomes a giant and you know you become, you're equally bright approximately whether an old giant or young giant. It's not true in detail and how do you get ages for giants because obviously the tracks are such a mess that by just going to this diagram that's not going to even age. And the other exciting field aside from Gaia in stellar physics has of course been the arrival of astroseismology. Astroseismology as you know is the way through surface pulsations effectively measure density and mass of a star. And just as a reminder measuring the mass of a star is of a giant is equal to measuring its age approximately. Because the giant evolution is so fast if you measure a giant to be two solar masses you know it's a little bit older than the main sequence lifetime the stable hydrogen burning on the main sequence. So this is why for giants measuring masses and ages is uh, equivalent again with the faith in the stellar evolution. So that exists and so for t you know for in the Kepler direction and other directions we have asteroseismic ages for giants. Good, but not in the heavily obscured regions of the galactic disk that I'd like to get to to actually learn about the evolution of our disk. So now let us return to five minutes earlier by design there are 2,000 by now 7,000 um, giants for which there's both astroseismic measurements about their masses or implied ages and apogee spectra. So now we can apply the same trick we just add age as one of these labels. We say predict the spectrum then we invert it and it works remarkably well you get the mass of a giant, so what's here is, this is cross validation, this is the astroseismic mass which I think for good reason you can trust at least in this regime and this is what we on the y axis what we reconstructed from spectra and the same thing here for, thank you, can I actually get it, no, I apologize, um, I thought I had my I'm actually returning to the same spot. Okay. okay. It's almost time for a community prayer here. Um, sorry, let me go back to here. So, um, and you get ages to 0.15 ticks. Now, the ratio between the age of the disk and one dynamical period is the ratio between 100 million years and 10 giga years, so 2 dex. So 0.15 dex, factor 1.4 is not an ultra precise age measurement but it certainly helps. Okay, so now it's time to say we have reached the point of data driven machine learning voodoo, right? You have the ground truth, you feed spectra and somehow they can return the ages. Can we understand why? And this is something that 
Marie Martig and Melissa Ness a few years ago have figured out. So it turns out that if you take um, stars for which you know the ages from asteroid seismology, here color coded blue is young and red is old, and you plot them, their surface abundances. Metallicity is the basic enhancement scale on the x axis, and carbon of a nitrogen on the y axis. And as you can see, if you can measure carbon over nitrogen at a given metallicity, that plot tells you um, that this actually gives you or correlates with age. What's actually even nicer is that there is an explanation of why that is. Let, and that has to do with dredge up. Let me walk you very briefly through this seemingly messy diagram on the bottom right. This is the interior composition of a star. The x-axis is again a radial coordinate in mass fraction. And the y-axis is the composition in different elements. And of course, CNO things happen at the inside. And what happens during the dredge up is that very deep convection occurs, which dredges up material. Let's see whether I can get my mouse back in here. Give me a sec. Which dredges up material from here, bringing up lots of nitrogen and actually perhaps diluting the carbon. And it turns out that how deep this convection goes depends on the mass of the star. So what one has is, and you know, everybody knows things in evol stellar evolution, once convection is involved, it's always quantitatively hard to make predictions. So what it can offer you a qualitative argument why it should be, and then a data-driven approach to give you actually ages for stars that are dynes. They're luminous, we see them throughout the galaxy. They're equally luminous whether they're old and young. So at some level, the ideal age tracer. And so that now brings us to an approach that we have gotten ages of stars across the entire Milky Way, because indeed this, these subgiant branch stars, this is where within one or two kiloparsecs around us, Gaia shines beautifully, but if you're in a dusty disk eight kiloparsecs away, that is a hard thing to do. So, what all of this has done, this detour through stellar spectroscopy said, okay, I know how to get consistent abundances among different surveys, how to get them even from very low resolution spectra, but most importantly, how to get ages. So, and you can make an age map like this. Red is old, blue is young. Unsurprisingly, older stars in the middle, younger stars at the outside. But now let's get back to the first three slides, which you may or may not have forgotten. Namely the question, what can we learn about the evolution of the Milky Way's stellar disk? Now that we have the distribution in orbits, abundances and ages from Apogee and also Gaia. And so let me go back again through um, these two sketches. If you stars start out clearly very patchy in their distribution, but I want to walk you through why disks are exponential. And let's just actually ask then, what happens in a galaxy to the orbits of stars, in a galaxy whose life has been as sheltered and boring as that of the Milky Way, without major merges apparently for the last um, two-thirds of its life? And one thing is very clear, stars are not born in bound clusters, so you get phase mixing, and it's long been known that occasionally you, ha you have a molecular cloud, a big massive scatterer that leads to some scattering. So that's been clear, and that's always been postulated why things look smooth, phase mixing, and also why things heat up in the vertical direction. Now about 15 years ago, um, and Jerry Selwood and James Spinney said, you know, um, that actually, even though our Milky Way is approximately axisymmetric, angular momentum 
is not an even approximately conserved quantity. So, in a term called, they dubbed radial orbit migration, they said there should be extensive diffusion of angular momentum. And let me just show you this little diagram, this cartoon. And um, what was shown here was just a spiral perturbation. And now consider two stars, basically siblings at the two beginnings of the two arrows. They are on the same orbit, just differ by phase. One of them experiences a torque to boost its angular momentum. The other one experiences a torque to lower its angular momentum. Now, if the spiral pattern was strictly periodic, that is like the two little moons of Saturn, you get a little torque that boosts the angular momentum. You go on a higher orbit, you fall back. And at some point later, you feel the other symmetric perturbation. You go in and you could go like that. That's called resonant trapping, nothing happens. But it turns out, if you have fleeting spiral features, as we have reason to assume that the Milky Way has, then by chance you either get torqued inward or outward, and this pattern isn't steady enough to undo the damage that leads to diffusion. And you know, Rob Groskar and many others have shown that actually should happen quite effectively. What's shown here is that actually, um, in a simulation as a function of time, stars can really migrate all over the place. At least that's what simulations say. And perhaps an equally important part is, if you're on a near circular orbit, near core rotation of somebody, that's the best way where you surf the torque wave for the longest and the diffusion is most effective. Right, so near circular orbits should actually experience the most angular momentum diffusion and actually they stay on near circular orbits. So the theory, and now let's just see how much the Milky Way actually does that. That effect must happen, but I will argue it's actually one that shapes the structure of our disk. How does one tackle this observationally? How do you find out where a star was born and whether it now has the angular momentum that it, uh, that it had at birth? Let me start with showing this plot here that shows as a function of radius the metallicity of stars recently born within the last dynamical period, in this case Cepheids. And you see that within 0.1 dex or so, there's hardly any scatter. So one way of saying this is at a given time, Stars born at a given radius all have nearly the same metallicity within a few hundredths. That is all, we see that in the Milky Way, there's evidence in other galaxies and even at higher redshift that picture is starting to emerge. If you then, however, look at the sample that I've shown you before, and let me just go now to the right hand side. Once you look at stars in the Milky Way, that's shown here, here um, that are um, seven giga years old. The, this is the, there's a complete mess at each radius. There's a vast range of metallicities. Now metallicity is a birth attribute that a star can't change. But orbital radius is not a birth attribute. So the explanation is qualitatively, you can go from a well-ordered metallicity to radius relation at birth to a messy one at older age if you change radii as indicated by those red stars. So now let me um, go to that and so what my student Nej Frankel following on the stuff that Sanders and Binney have done is let's just say can we actually ask how strong this effect is in the Milky Way and so what we say is we presume stars are born with a unique relation between metallicity and radius with some star formation history and then they diffuse. And what are the combinations of these options that work? So you, s you have to specify when and where stars were born. Then you have to specify at what metallicity, that's your lifelong tag, they were born. And right, the basic picture shown on the right hand side here is that any given radius enrichment which really should be called pollution, right? 
just progresses as a function of time, but always the deeper you are in the potential well, the more pollution has occurred or the more enrichment. Right, so, that's, so you have a family of possible ways how this could have happened and you say fine, let me just make a, the simplest model for how stars change the orbital radius. Let's just say it's a diffusion that is the scaling one would expect to see how much they drift away from the birth radii. And so the assumption is that a population of stars in the course of time changes radii like this. We want to find out how strong this effect is and again this is actually a good way of illustrating why if you go here right if you see this here at this radius here at 11 kiloparsecs you have all of a sudden a mix of stars born much closer in even a comparable mix some born further out and some born nearby and they of course will have different metallicities because the level of pollution depends both as function of time and radius. Okay, if you do that you make a model for all of these parameters, you try to fit it to the age metallicity distribution of those stars and then um, you see what comes out and the only point of this corner plot is to show you that indeed um, these things are not degenerate and you can learn about them. Let me just show you the two things the main thing that comes out is first of all that this is the level of radial migration that should happen and the thing to take away is that in order to explain why young stars have this tight relation, old stars are such a mess which Bini and Schoenrich have long conjectured, you need stars to migrate by about a half light or half mass radius over the age of the disk. So it has to be a very big effect over 8 giga years about 3 kiloparsecs. The other kind of cute thing is that of course you also get a model for um, in this model the age and the metallicity tell you where you were born. So we know the sun and its metallicity and you know in this case the sun four and a half giga years ago at solar metallicity that was a little bit outside of 5 kiloparsecs. Nice thing is we're now 3 kiloparsecs further out and what was the typical distance that a star should migrate in the, if this model is right? About 3 kiloparsecs. So that's um, just to, to, to look at this. Now the last part of this um, is let me also now bring in Gaia and not just use radii because I had argued or Selwyn Binney had said it's best to surf these torques if you're on a near circular orbit and then you actually also stay on a near circular orbit. But in principle stars can change their current radius from their birth radius by two ways. Either you diffuse an angular momentum or you just boost your eccentricity and that just makes you in the course of your life cover a lot of different radii. And the question is which of those two is the dominant process? So you can make a similar model as I just described and Nish Frankel and Jason Sanders have just done that but actually instead of radius use angular momentum and eccentricity or in modern speak the angular momentum is the azimuthal action and the eccentricity is the amount of in and out motion the radial action. And so here you see um, a version is this is just the same plot as before in angular momentum and now we can ask how much um, eccentricity or radial action do they pick up. So the nice thing is about action coordinates, they have the same unit, angular momentum and radial action all have the same units, this non-intuitive um, kiloparsecs kilometer a second. Um, but now what you can actually see is while the plots look alike they should have the same. So if plotted on the same y axis the amount of radial motion is vastly lower than the needed diffusion in angular momentum. So indeed in the Milky Way we see at least from 6 to 10 kiloparsecs that um, this is 
um, this is how far um, that it's mostly a diffusion in angular momentum. Okay, um, I'm three minutes away from wrapping up, but let me show you, or let me try to make good on the last promise, namely explaining exponential disks. So I've just shown you that this radial migration needs to be very efficient in order to explain the data. Migration by of order the size of the system and that stars stay on near circular orbits. So let's do a thought experiment. Um, what if radial migration was really efficient? And let's think of radial migration as the thing that scrambles angular momentum because things just trade places. So the question is what um, profile do you get if you scramble the angular momentum maximally, maximize the entropy, while no star gets lost, conserving total mass, conserving total angular momentum, and stars remaining on circular orbits, which means that remains a one-dimensional problem. Um, now, then of course you realize that this problem has been solved in a different context by Boltzmann in 1872. Um, and my student Jakob Heppich insisted using fractal notation in style of Boltzmann in the paper. But of course, what you write down is um, to maximize this, you have your Lagrange multipliers, you do variational calculus and all this kind of stuff. And unsurprisingly, an exponential in angular momentum is the solution to that. Now you can be for a moment uh, happy about this because aren't disk profiles exponential? Yes, but they're exponential in their surface mass density, not in their, exp uh, in their angular momentum. And surface mass density has to, uh, the angular momentum is where you are in the circular velocity and of course density has, has, has uh, a one of our volume factor in it. So really what you would expect is an exponential in radius divided by one over r plus a correction for the rotation curve. So you would expect the profile to diverge but perversely the rotation curves in galaxies actually rise slowly. You plug this in for typical numbers and this is shown here for just nearby galaxies and actually the maximal entropy scrambled profile, which of course is a thought experiment, um, looks remarkably like an exponential disk with a little blip in the middle, often seen in galaxies. Now it's important to realize that this is only a thought experiment because if one had really reached the thermodynamic limit, then there wouldn't be gradients of anything. So the point to take away is that no matter what profile you start out with, this radial migration or angular momentum scrambling drives you towards an exponential. And even if that process is incomplete, very quickly profiles start looking very much close to exponential. Okay, um, finishing before one despite the late start, let me just give you the upshot what I'd like you to take away from this in two parts. So, um, in order to use stars in the Milky Way, eventually also other galaxies, to play all these games, you really have to understand their parameters well without systematics, etc. And this data-driven approach that ultimately just exploits that spectra are deterministic and the same stars that have the same properties have the same spectrum, even though that I don't understand why that is, allows you to tie in properties of large star samples to the few cases where you understand things well. Right, so, so that, that stuff actually is important and I think we haven't run our course there. And then I have shown you one example, I, there, there, the other versions of this, can we then use having ages, orbits and abundances um, these, these spectral samples with Gaia to use the Milky Way as a test bit for galaxy formation. So I've used the abundances because they were birth tags that can't change. 
I've used the ages because that's vital and obviously the orbits or the positions you have. And so what I'm concluding from this is in some sense while the Milky Way looks smooth, that is really the consequence even in its disk of very serious dynamical memory loss, angular momentum memory loss that has worked just enough that not all gradients are wiped out, but that there is actually an immense amount of regularity. So this is why galaxies on a large scale can look, this can look regular even though they still have some gradients left. And that um, I could go back into this, but now obviously both for the spectroscopy I've only used one abundance. I've only used a minimal amount of Gaia information. There's a lot more to go. But for now, I thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. So, in your slide, uh, you were uh, trying to quantify the amount of infusion of the mm -hmm. Can you give us a, like, an intuitive explanation of uh, what in the data is able to kind of bring to the generacy and say, you know, the, the vast majority comes from migration instead of uh, feeding? Ah, okay. So, there. So I, let, me, let me try to re-articulate to make sure I got the question. The, the question, the two parts, what is it in the data that says, that supports my argument that radial migration must be extensive? And the second part is how come, what's the argument that actually this isn't just basically heating in the plane which is eccentricity boosting. Okay, good. Um, so the, um, This, let me just go back to here, blah, blah, blah. The, if this, ah, okay. So, we see that now there is a tight relation among young stars between metallicity and radius. It is an assumption. We see this in our Milky Way. We see this mostly in H2 regions in all other nearby spirals. So I'm then turning this to, into an assumption that this has always been true. Right, so that's the art, that's the, that is an assumption, but I think it's a well-founded one. That's why radii must, must change. That, that's a zeroth order thing. Then the, the other argument, what's the argument that this is mostly actually um, drift in angular momentum rather than eccentricity boosting? And that is that comes from um, this plot and now. So what we do here is basically, you know, Nej and uh, Nej Frankel and Jason Sanders, we've generalized not just modeling radii but asking what is the distribution of stars in age, angular momentum, eccentricity, etc., as a function of age. And so you basically say, fine, we have a diffusion term in angular momentum and one in eccentricity. And that's angular momentum is shown on the right and one on the left. So given that those two things have the same unit, radial action, radial migration, right? It just shows that the diffusion in angular momentum is an order of magnitude larger than the diffusion angular momentum. But to be actually, and now I'm going to jump up despite my intentions on to, but keep in mind um, there are two y axes on each of those. Um, the, here it's what does this translate into distance, right? And that's basically three kiloparsecs after. And here, this is actually the, um, 
This is the radial epicycle amplitude, which is actually at first looks like one and a half kiloparsecs. That's quite a bit, right? So it is true that stars, of course, um, gain that much of eccentricity, right? And, and the typical old star in the Milky Way just goes in and out by about one and a half kiloparsecs, right? Um, so, this is why if you fit the model, that is what comes out. If, as you asked, I want to compare the two effects, I have no choice but taking the scale where the units are the same. And then in these units, radial action is in order of magnitude smaller. So that's a long-winded answer to, to that question. Those are the two arguments, and I've run off this camera, apparently. Um, so the, uh, the short, uh, why is radial migration can be approximated as a diffusive process, right? Um, so there's, let me first say the cheap answer is that we actually, you know, this ansatz we simply adopted from, from Sanders and Binney. The reason why I think that's actually, if you are in the limit, that you're experiencing random torques, right, back and forth, then um, it actually is a diffusive process, right? But of course, um, one of the next things to do is to actually ask, you know, illustrious TNG and other simulations are now good enough to actually ask how good this approximation is. That's correct. So the uh, age of the I, I guess one way of asking this question is, I've of course gone for this purpose completely into the pre-hierarchical cosmology mode and said nothing ever falls in. Mm. You know, I think one of the remarkable things about, as I said, the Milky Way is that that's actually for a galaxy that big a surprisingly good approximation. The question of what actually, whether external torques have a, n a similar net effect is another thing to actually look at and I think um, I think the you know again simulations are the only way forward when you said the age dispersion relation that meant the in-plane dispersion the vertical dispersion and yeah um, th that's that's true, but the vertical dispersion among young stars, and we'll get out of this rabbit hole in just a second, right? I mean, given that to a perturbation, disks respond by oscillating, all of a sudden you have to decide whether actually you want a central second moment as a dispersion at a rigid plane or just the local part. So I actually find all of this, you know, it's even. In, in comparison to simulations, it doesn't matter what you take um, as long as you do it consistently. Yeah. So the, the last thing to say is that, I mean, one of the, the crazy things is that Gaia shows you there's so much structure and messiness that any simple model, you know, in a formal sense is of course completely rejected. I still think we actually have to work through these as a baseline before we get more complex. Okay. Okay. So you should have two papers of micro-rules. The 
Ah, so if you fit it in, in, in angular momentum, okay, if you look closely now at 6 giga years, this is 2.73 kiloparsecs, but that's diffusion in angular momentum. I, I can, I'm happy to, to talk about skeletons in the closet even though they actually, and here after 6 giga years it is 3.2. So in a formal sense, they're not the same, but the ballpark number actually remains unchanged. There's a separate question if you actually want to model it as diffusion in angular momentum. Do you want to conserve angular momentum, total angular momentum, or really do you want to treat it like an accretion disk where you have all these net flows in, right? I mean, that's another way of thinking about this is actually an accretion disk kind of flow where the fleeting spirals act as your viscosity. But now I, okay, before I go off the deep end. Maybe I have uh, one, more, one more question also, which is that uh, uh, what do we know, what do we know about uh, the dispersion of the metallicity in the gas radius? Because ah. we're assuming that there is, uh, you'll see a metallicity in an age, you can infer where that's not taken from. I, I have um, two things to say. So in external galaxies, people are proud in H2 regions to discover that dispersion, but it seems to be at the 0.05 to 0.08 dex. So it's small, not zero. The other thing is that with all these spectroscopic surveys, we have to do more, is to actually look at the abundances of young stars, you know, because the question of I mean, my way of thinking, say, of a cepheid, you know, nobody measures iron in the interstellar medium. You can't. A, a young star, whether it's an O star, B star, or a cepheid, encapsulates the interstellar medium. The cepheid back illuminates a pleasant 5,000 Kelvin gas so that you get to see all the metal lines. So young star spectroscopy, you should think of as the best way to actually, in the future, in these surveys, find out how well the ISM is actually mixed at a given radius. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. I think it's a defensible assumption in here that the dispersion is small, but we should look at it more in, in the Milky Way. Yeah. 